So, one of the songs this morning, I love it, I just wrote it down. It says, the Lord is my tower and gives me the power. Yeah. Well, it says it all. And today's message is about becoming an overcomer. And it really is down to that. You know, as a child of God, you know, there are certain things that God gives us and He gives us His power and so that we can be an overcomer. There's a lovely song that says, just as I start out, it says, we have come into this place gathered in His name to worship Him. And I love this song, so help a brother out this morning and sing along with me. We have come into this place gathered in His name to worship Him. We have come into this place gathered in His name to worship Him. We have come into this place Gathered in His name to worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship Him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Now I love the second part. It says, Now forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship. What does He tell you to do? Oh, forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Christ alone. Oh, worship Him, Jesus Christ Hallelujah. Thank you so much. So tonight, today, Let's forget about ourselves. Amen. Let's forget about the troubles, the aggravation, the sorrows, the pain, the hurts, the anxiety, the fears, all of those things. When we're in His presence, they just got to fall off us this morning. Because I believe that God has the power to allow us to overcome every situation. There is no situation this morning that we cannot overcome. There was a man I was preaching, I was preaching in a church in Austria uh, about two years ago. And I remember a man came up afterwards and he was smoking for 40 years. And I said, listen, I believe God's got the power today to help you overcome this small little thing that has had power over your life for 40 years. And I said, I believe that not alone will you overpower today, but God will add 15 years to your life. If you stand strong today. And you know, I met that man uh, last week and I was preaching in that same church. And he's there chewing, chewing gum. And I think for over two years, he has stopped smoking. A man that was a chain smoker for 40 years. So, even the little things, God can give you the power today. If there's anything in your life today that you're struggling with, that you haven't fully got the victory on, I want to give you some good news. That today is a day that you can be set free, made whole, delivered, and be made strong in your mind and your heart, and go on to fulfill what God has got for you. Amen. The scripture this morning, if you have your Bible, that's fine. If not, I will call it out. And it's in 1 John 5, 4. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Hallelujah. We give you thanks, God, for all that you're doing. We praise you, we bless your holy name. How many know I'm not ashamed to praise the name of Jesus this morning? I'm not ashamed of his name, hallelujah. I'm willing at any point to stand up for him and just lift up his name because I know as we lift up his name, as we sow up, he will sow down. As we lift up the name of Jesus, it says that he gathers, he calls people to himself, he collects people to himself because the name is a wonderful name. And the Word of God says this, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is not maybe, this is not might. This is an absolute definite Word of God that says that if, if you are a child of God, and you have truly been born of God, then it's an absolute must 
that the evidence of your faith you must overcome. There is nothing in your life that you cannot overcome if you truly have been born of God. That's it. Otherwise, it makes God out to be a liar. Now, the, all it means is that you have to have the willingness to overcome. You know, a lot of people are happy being sick. They're happy having problems. They're happy in bad situations. They're happy with addictions. And they're happy to leave things the status quo. But if you're an overcomer and you truly want to see the victory in an area of your life or your family or, or something, then you have to believe God for the victory. The Bible says we have the victory. Not that we're going to get the victory. We already have the victory. That we are men, women, sons and daughters of faith. And faith is what? We are, it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we don't see God, but yet we believe. We believe that there is a heaven after we die and we take our last breath that we go to be with the Lord. We have faith to believe that. We haven't received it yet, but that's what faith is. If we could see God, we wouldn't need faith. Because our eyes could see God. But because we don't see God, we need a thing called faith to believe in something we do not see. And that's simply what faith is. That's why, you know, we, we, God has given us this faith on the inside. To believe how blessed we are to believe and not see. We are more blessed to believe in God even though we don't see Him. But the whole of creation speaks out. Our faith, it says, this is a very key part. It says, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. It is impossible to overcome unless you have faith. And faith is the key, the substance, in order to see the victory in our lives. I was watching a Chinese man on a building site with one leg carry a wheelbarrow full of bricks and empty it. I saw the other day a football player with crutches. He had one leg and he had crutches kicking a, bo a ball, playing on a team. You know, there are people out there that will not say no. They will overcome whatever situation that faces them. And we the children of God will have situations. So you're going to have to dig deep somewhere. Because many people think, oh, if you come to Jesus, everything will be smooth sailing. It is not the case. In actual fact, it's the opposite. Because those who truly come and believe will be tested. And many times go through sufferings. And, it's a, and, and heartache and pain and loss. How many of us here today have gone through some loss? whether loved ones or families. I was reading a story. The other, no, it was actually on, um, I think it was Britain's Got Talent. And this young boy, or America's Got Talent, this young boy, maybe in his teenager, he was singing and his brother went off to the army and it says that his brother committed suicide. So this young teenager went off to Japan singing and stuff like that. And he got a, a call from his father to say that his younger brother has just committed suicide. And so the UFC people go through terrible situations and trials and much worse than that. And people have to overcome. People have to put a smile on their face. But we as the believers must overcome if we are truly children of God. I want to explain something to you today. Many Christians today, they have faith to believe or to ask God for something. But you know, many Christians don't have the faith to receive what they ask. Yeah. Yeah. And I only got this the other day. The Lord showed me, he says, faith to believe, faith to receive, and faith to achieve. And it's like a, a family, maybe a husband and wife, they want to have a child. They want to believe and ask God to bless them with a child. But you've got to have faith to receive that. And you go from being pregnant to giving birth. You've achieved what you were asking for. The manifestation of your faith came about. And that's when we ask God for something, when we have faith to believe, we have to have the faith to receive so we can see the manifestation of what we're asking for. And many people stop off at just the asking stage. We've got to believe. When you start 
asking God for something. You've got to stop praising Him for that. You've got to start acting like you have already received it. Hallelujah. The blind men, you know, that, that were around Jesus in that day, they were following Him. No, they were blind, and it says they were following Him. So obviously they heard the crowd, they kept following the noise. And Jesus came to them and He said, he said this interesting question. He said, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, we want back our sight. And Jesus asked him, do you believe I am able to do this? Now he asked them the question. And it was up to their response whether they would have received their sight. Jesus was testing their faith. He was testing them to see would they respond by the right words. Because... From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever's in a person's heart will come out to their mouth, whether it's good or evil. So when you're speaking words of faith, they got to come from within. Faith-filled words have to come from a vessel that's filled with faith. And those words are the very things that get God moving in action. It, gets, it puts legs to our prayers. It, it puts everything in motion. When God sees a little bit of faith, it is then that God starts to release those things. And these two blind men says, yes, Lord. And they receive their faith. What can you believe, God, today for? What is it that you are struggling with for a long time, maybe? Maybe you're waiting to see something. God do something in your life. What is it that you're holding on to for so long that we have to see the manifestation of those things. Because we, are, we have the right as children of God. We have the right to overcome every situation in Him. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here that's believing God for something? And believing God for the manifestation? Because I need to hear a yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Because God said, do you believe Amen. that He is able to do that thing for you? Amen. Because if you can truly believe that, you can truly see the manifestation of those things. In Mark 9 it says, It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. Are you telling me if? Should that word even be in a sentence with Jesus? If he can? Jesus replied, Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. But you know what the boy's father said to Jesus? He said, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. That's a very strange, one minute you're saying you're believing, now you're asking the same person you're saying it to, pray for me, help me with my unbelief. Because in all of us, there might be an area in our hearts and our lives that yes, we have the faith to believe God and ask God. But do you really have the faith to receive the very things you're asking for? Because that's going to be that's going to be your test. That's going to be where you step out of the boat and begin to walk on water. Because we can all ask God for many things and not receive them. But you have to step over from this kind of beginning faith to a receiving faith, to a manifestation of that faith. And that's what, there's no point asking God for something if He don't do it. I want to see those prayers being answered. I mean, that's the difference. We're supposed to be a people of God who see God moving in our lives and answering our prayers. I don't want to go to another prayer meeting only to be let down the next day or the next year. I want to see God praying. I want this to be the church that is praying for the Peter that's in prison and the very thing you're praying for will come knocking at the door. Amen. That's the type of faith I want to be part of. And if you walk with the wise, you shall be wise. If you walk with fools, you shall be a fool. If you walk with the anointed people, you shall have the anointing. If you walk with prophets, you will begin to prophesy. So if we walk together with people of faith, we should see the manifestation of those faith. Hallelujah. A young boy in London, I remember, you know, the paddy wagon would be there every Friday night to bring all the, the, the drunken Irish. And I was in the middle of them. No, I wasn't that drunk, but I had a few. But the paddy wagon would be there to drive you away. 
and every Irish person that gets arrested in London will be resisting the arrest. And I learned something. I said, well, resisting is really fighting back. Because every Friday night I'd see guys all over the bars and everywhere, and they'd be all fighting back. No, you have to drag them into the police wagon. Resisting is fighting back with the weapon that God has given you. And if you don't use them, you don't have the victory. Your faith is not working the way God wants it to work. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide soul and spirit, bone and marrow. That's how sharp the word of God is. And that Jesus used the word of God against the enemy. So I have given you authority, the Bible says, to trample over all, to tread upon scorpions and snakes and all the power of the enemy. Your authority is a weapon. You know, there is a story about the seven sons of Sceva. They didn't have permission to use the name of Jesus. And they were exorcists and they were Jewish exorcists. And they went to try to cast out a demon out of a man. And they said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul talks about, really, who Paul believes in. But they didn't believe. They had no authority. And the demon and the man beat them all up and sent them out the door. Seven of them. Because they didn't have authority and the demons didn't recognize their authority. So they didn't have the victory. But we have authority to use the name of Jesus, Yeshua, above all names. That is our benefit as a Christian. So we have to access that. God has called us to be an overcomer, not an overachiever. You know, so many people get caught up with trying to overachieve. Whether it's in their education, they're never happy with a degree. It's got to be a PhD, it's got to be a master's. And I know people that have so many degrees, they're possessed with degrees. And they haven't got no job and got no money. And they're the most highest educated people on the planet. And they ain't got no money. And they ain't got no jobs. Some of them are overqualified. And all they did was to overachieve, to show, look at the piece of paper I have. What's the point in getting a degree or PhD or master or whatever it is, if you don't put it into practice? If you don't use it for the very purpose you went to get it for in the first place? What is the point? And you have a lot of people today who are trying to overachieve rather than being overcome for Christ. It is good to achieve. Don't get me wrong, it's good to succeed, but we must overcome first as children of God in order to be successful in this world. Mm -hmm. But it says, take heart, I have overcome the world. What is the world? We know that, look, we can talk about sin and we can talk about demons and devils and all that, but there's a lot more in life that we have to overcome than just spiritual things. I mean, there's a lot going on when you have a family and you have children and and you have concerns and worries and your children are in the world and you're struggling with all of these things that they're being tempted with. I mean, there's a lot of things going on that as parents we have to learn to overcome. And sometimes we have to wait on God and be patient. Sometimes it's a waiting game. Sometimes it doesn't automatically happen. Sometimes there's a length of time that is put in place. Even healing. There are sometimes I pray for myself. I never got healing, but I believe the word of God says, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Some immediately, some in time. But everything I pray for, I'm healed. Sometimes it took a bit of time. And that's okay. As long as I get the manifestation. And I continue with the manifestation. Do you know Strong's Concordance? It explains overcomer. The word overcomer comes from a Greek word. You're going to like this. For those that don't know it, the word Nike. <laughs> yeah, that's where it comes from, the Strong's. You know the Nike shoes and the Nike... And do you know where that word Nike comes from? Oh, this is going to be funny because I actually like Nike. I actually see a sign down there, Nike. It's one of my favorites. You know, they're more comfortable, they're good quality. But you know where Nike, the word came from? It came named after a Greek goddess. Yeah, and it was the winged goddess Nike. Nike. And this is and why they got the symbol was reflecting it was a winged goddess that the Greeks used to believe in. Now it's a false goddess, of course. But that's where they got the name from, and it meant to prevail with victory. So we're walking around with symbols that represent a Greek god, a false god, 
you'd never think that now, would you? Is that an eye opener? <laughs> Hallelujah. That, that would kind of make you think though, wouldn't it? You see, I love, I'm going to change over to Adidas or Adidas, whatever way you want to say it. I, I'm so confused now with the word. I don't know which is right because my children keep correcting me. I don't know if it's Adidas or Adidas, whatever it is. Anyway, but Adidas, they have these lines, these three lines, and they get smaller, a little bit bigger, and it's in the shape of a mountain. And what it symbol represents is about overcoming the mountains, overcoming the challenges. So it has a great meaning to it. So a lot of these symbols do have meanings to them. And it says in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So there is a plan, there is a way that God gives us the strategies to overcome certain situations. And unless our faith is built up and understanding God and His Word and how we can how we can put the Word in our daily living, that's wisdom. Applying God's knowledge in our daily living is wisdom. And that's where we have to learn how to put God's Word in our daily life, daily, the daily bread. What are some of the things that we have to overcome? As I spoke about, we have to overcome the power to of the enemy by resisting. Resisting some of the temptations. Resisting, you know, people. You have to be very careful, and I always preach this, about going into partnerships with even other Christians. You have to be very careful with partnerships in these days. Because you find out that a lot of them get broke up and it all goes haywire. You have, you've got to learn to resist the temptation to jump into something speedily. That's why the Bible says, do not make hasty decisions. And often people jump into something without really praying about it, seeking counsel, taking time. And I've made that mistake. That's why I can preach it. See, I can preach this morning about being an overcomer because there are many things I've had to overcome in my spiritual walk, physically, family, so many things. God has given me the victory in it. And I like to preach stuff that I've experienced, that's relevant, that, and that's fresh. Because I just got the victory, hallelujah. Just recently about something, I got the victory. And because of that, I've overcome a situation that was really bothering me, and I've overcome it. And because of that, this message was birthed today. And I believe that same anointing that God placed on my life for that situation is the same anointing today that is resting upon your life, that will rest upon your situation, that will give you the victory today. That you've got to get this word in your heart and in your spirit and run with it and apply it to whatever situation you're... Is there anybody here knows what I'm talking about? That needs God. Needs God to do something. Amen. I'm not ashamed. I, I just came through something. And I can, I've can i come out the other end. Hallelujah. And I can see God's hand. His powerful hand. That he didn't forget me. And he won't forget you. That he hasn't finished with us yet. That as long as there is breath in our bodies. God is still at work. We're still under construction. Hallelujah. By the Holy Ghost. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardships, persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or the sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, none of any of those things in the world, can separate us from the love of Christ because God has called us to overcome. There will be hardships. It would be false teaching to stand up here and to tell you, come to Jesus and everything will be smooth. Yeah. It would be a lie. It's a lie. It is a lie. The reality is you're going to be tested. It's going to hurt sometimes, but it's going to make you stronger. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's going to make you more like Christ. Amen. Because the best people to go back into the hospital are the very people that came out of it. Mm -hmm. The best people to send back into the prisons are the very ones that got saved in the prison and, and took out. Because they've gone through something. That's why Paul the Apostle was a good minister. Because he had been whipped so many times. 
He had been in the sea left for dead so many times. He had gone hungry so many times. He had experienced all of these things. So he was able to understand people's situations and problems. Because he had, he had gone through all of this. And well, how can you be a good minister? How can I really teach others unless, you know, if I get saved on a Friday and I start preaching on a Sunday? Tell me, how can I give you anything of real value if I have no experience about God in my own life? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would be just preaching words. But the words have meaning mm -hmm. because you have experience. So it's one thing to receive faith from the Word of God. But additional to your faith, where you start to get your prayers answered, mm -hmm. now your faith starts to rise a little more. Mm -hmm. You start to see the hand prophecies being fulfilled. Hang on a minute, the gifts of the Holy Ghost in manifestation. Now your faith, not alone through the Word of God, rises. But your faith increases through the experiences you have with God, the Holy Spirit, and walking your faith day by day. These are the very things you've got to start working on in your own life, believe in God to help you in that situation. That it's not over, till God says it's over. He has the last say in everything we do. Hallelujah. And it's okay, there's, there's people teaching that. I will never ever teach that philosophy. That's all that is to me. Once you give one, you say one prayer, you're saved forever and ever. You dare, you've got to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. There has to be evidence that you have overcome something. You cannot stay in it if you're saying you're a child of God. You've got to come out of it. There has to be a separation. We cannot just say, well, you know, I come to Jesus on Sunday and then go and come back for two years, live all of the way I want to live in those two years and expect to get into heaven. Is that what we're saying that the blood of Jesus is worth? That we can trample on the blood of Jesus after that great sacrifice? We can't do that. We have to be a people that look, we come to the Lord, we believe, and we stay with Him. Yes, people backslide, but you've got to repent and come back to Him and say, Lord, forgive me, because He is a merciful God. But we don't want to die in that place where we leave the Lord. That's a dangerous place for a Christian to be. And I know there are many teachings that look at you may believe, you have to believe what you want to believe. But I believe there are too many scriptures that talks about a person losing their salvation. John chapter 15 talks about that Jesus is the vine and his father is the gardener and he cuts off every branch in him that bears no fruit. The branches are Christians. He cuts off the branch in him that bears no fruit. But the branches that do bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. He said, remain in me. Without that, you can do nothing. He said, if we don't remain in him, we are like branches that wither and die. They are only fit for the fire. That's a very eye-opening scripture. I know there's a scripture that says that nothing will snatch, him, snatch us out of his hand. But what about if you just decide to leave out of his hand? Mm. You yourself just decide to walk out of his hand and his care. Mm. Nothing can snatch you, but you yourself have a choice every day to stay in his hand, to put your hand in his hand and continue to walk in it. At any time you're bringing your child across the road, they can pull their hand out of your hand. You know when you're walking across a busy road, you, you hold your child's hand tight. So they can pull it out. But if you hold that child's hand loose, they can pull it out and run right in front of the car. That's the difference. We have to be careful. If you are an overcomer, you have to testify. Overcomers are constantly testifying because they're always overcoming. And that's why the Word of God, word of God says that we have overcome the devil by what? The Word of our testimony. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, we have overcome. So this is evidence. By what you're saying, there's nothing worse than to hear a defeated believer mourning every Sunday the same defeat. I want to hear the sound of victory. Amen. I want to see every person get to the place God wants them to be. That's what God wants us to do. 
Overcoming obstacles. There's only obstacle in your way. There's only mountain. Do you know we serve a God who's a mountain moving God? He, there's no mountain. There's even a scripture in the Bible at the end time. He says that he splits the mountain in two in order for the Israelites to walk through. So listen this morning. I don't care if God removes the mountain, brings you around the mountain, brings you over the mountain, or brings you to the mountain. As long as you get to where you need to be for him, he Amen. will make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen. He is the master of the wind. Amen. He is the master of the rain. Amen. He can calm the storm at any time. He can bring the storm and he can bring it through the storm. He's the maker of the storm. But God can do anything at any time for any of us. There's nothing he cannot do. Hallelujah. Overcomers pursue their enemies. People who are overcomers, they just don't walk, they don't lie down, roll over and play dead. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, when you look at David, when he had lost his family, you know, his 600 men were about to stone him. But the one thing, he didn't roll over and play dead and hang himself. No, he got up, he, well he got down actually, got down on his knees, inquired of the Lord, received some strength down there, got back up, pursued his enemies, took back his wife and children and all his men, wife and children and plunder. Overcomers do not have self-pity parties and live in them. Yes, we can be upset, but you've got to rise up. There's a time you can't be crying yourself to sleep every night. And we are children of God. God does not want us to live that life. We have to have some power on the inside of us. God has to put the steel inside of us to make us stand up strong. A child of God to cause us to overcome temptations and people trying to entice us into situations that we can say no and walk away. I can go to a bar and have a drink of orange. I don't care how many people are drinking because that, that doesn't have power over me. You can smoke in my presence, people can smoke. Doesn't bother me. It will never tempt me because I got power to say no to those things. I won't get involved in bad relationships and stuff because I've got something on the inside of me to overcome all of those things. I'm a little bit wiser now. As you get older, you start to learn about, you know, you learn to say no a lot more. You learn to question things. You learn to see the motive, try to see the motive and things. You, you get wiser because if you've been hurt a few times, if you, you know, it's like you can give things, give money to people and you know you never see them again. You start to learn your lesson, don't you? You know, you start to hey, wise up a little bit. Because there are people that, they're skilled in manipulation. Yes. They're skilled yes. to get things out of you. Because they see, and sometimes as Christians, we are so loving and we want to be so kind. But we're easily fooled. Yeah. And we need to be a little bit smarter. Because people will try to deceive you and, and try to take what you got. And, yeah, I heard someone said, Someone before said that they, that they would take the eyes out of your head and come back later for the eyelashes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the way they are. That's how skilled some people are. There are some people so skilled. You know, like these pyramid schemes. They will come and they will get people together and they will talk about this scheme that you're going to make loads of money. You just got to buy into it. Buy it. And you see the top guys, they're always making money. And you find all you're doing is spending money. And these, because there are some people who are skilled they will persuade you and they will take everything you got and they will have every type of story. Even beggars. They will give you every sad story you can imagine. Now I'm not going to go give people money begging on the street and then they got a bottle of Heineken beside them. I'm not doing it. I'm not enabling that kind of thing. No, I will buy some food and give to someone. But you start to get wiser as you get older. Hallelujah. You're supposed to anyway. Overcomers breed overcomers. Like I said earlier, the wise walk with the wise. And, and some of you mothers here and fathers, you know the old saying in Ireland, you know, show me your friends and I'll tell you what you are. Mm. You know, it's, it's the old saying that I know it's not gospel, but there is scriptures in there. You know, when you can't, yeah, yeah, see, bad company corrupts good character. It's, it's in there, but it's in a different wording, but it's there. So we have to be real careful, hallelujah. Not everything is, it is as you seem it to be. Overcomers breed overcomers. And the fivefold ministry, 
is there for one purpose, to bring all the church up to maturity in the faith. You know, that's the goal of pastors, apostles, teachers, prophets, evangelists, is to bring all people up in unity and maturity in the faith, so that they will be strong in the faith, not needing milk, but eating solid food. That's really our jobs as ministers, to see others come to that place where they stand strong for themselves. And that's the, that's the goal of the overcomer. You know, there is nothing more in the Bible, nothing more in the Bible that I see, I've, I've looked, that I see God rewarding the person for than overcoming a situation. I, when I look, I'm going to go over to some of them quickly now. But in the Bible, I have not seen anything, any subject that has given more reward than the overcomer. That's how important it is. Young people, middle-aged people, there are no old people here, thank God. <laughs> we must overcome. Well, my, my daughter would tell me I'm old, so we must overcome. I want to talk to you about the rewards. Just some of the rewards before I close up. The rewards for overcoming in the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven churches. There are many different churches. So, and each church had a situation. Each church had certain things going on in the church that they had to overcome. Jesus also commended them for some good things that they were doing, but he also warned them for some other things. Some of the things that Jesus warned them were, are so eye-opening that it's scary. It is actually scary because he said, if you do not overcome, this is going to happen to you. Now, we know that these churches, they all have names that were there in that time. But remember, John's prophecies were all about the future. And these seven churches could be the whole state of all churches together. Different type of things going on in church today. It's very possible. Or it has some other meaning. But it's not the point. The point is that these were the things that meant something to Jesus. And if it means something to him to speak so much about it, it has to mean something to us. Amen. So I want you just to look at some of these things. I'm just going to call them out. The first reward was for the Ephesus church. And it says, they endured hardships. Now, you see... I preached in American churches. There was, and I think I said it here before. I'll just say it for those that didn't hear it. I preached in an American church. Many big churches, many small churches. But I was in a very poor, I was in the worst neighborhood in Long Island. The worst neighborhood. I was the only white man living in this neighborhood and they really thought I was either FBI or I was mad. And that was the only thing. But the people were so scared of me because of God. Because some things God did that put the fear of God in all of them. Nobody would touch me. Nobody touched my van. Here I was. It helped having a little bit of an accent because then I was American. But being a white man in a gang infested neighborhood, the worst neighborhood you, neighborhood you can imagine. There was gang rapes. There was killings constantly in this neighborhood. And here I am in the middle of it. And it was so poor that when I preached in this rich church in Long Beach, the pastor of the church, he called me up one day, he said, Paul, do you know anybody that would need $600? There was nobody in his church he could think of to give it for Christmas time. That he called me up knowing that I live in this place. Is there anybody you can think of? And I knew this woman, she had a disease and she had many children. And I went to the house for that and they, they had nothing. And I knew straight away it was for her. And I gave it to her just before Christmas Day and the joy that came upon her life. But can you imagine that there are churches that are so wealthy they don't even really need the money. And there's a church in, in the Bible that talks about that. But these people in Ephesus, they had hardships. But Jesus said to them, if you overcome, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life. Mm -hmm. There were two trees in the garden that talks about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God told Adam and Eve, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But they were banned from eating from the tree of life. And that tree of life represents obviously eternal life. That they would have the right to have eternal life if they overcome. Now I want you to think about that. And go back and read it for yourself. That he's saying that if you overcome, I will reward you with 
that you will be able to eat from the tree of life in paradise, in heaven. So if we don't overcome, what does that mean? So you got to think this way. Now, let's look again. Number two, Smyrna. It says, you will not be hurt by the second death if you overcome. Just think about this now. Do you see the pattern that Jesus is trying to tell the church? If you overcome, you will not be hurt by the second death. The second death is for unbelievers. Yeah. That's the lake of fire. Why is he even mentioning this to a church? This is like some serious warning. The possibility of you not getting into eternal life, but being in the lake of fire. That's what he said. It won't hurt you if you overcome. But if you don't overcome, it will hurt you. That's what he's saying. There's, you, you can't, there's no gray area. It's very black and white to me. Mm. And here's the thing. It says some of you will be put in prison and talked about for 10 days. I really like the scripture because what God showed me about the scripture was that these people were suffering for 10 days. They were put in prison by the, by the Satan, it says. And I've got to say this to somebody here. You see, there was a beginning and there was an end to this suffering. It was for 10 days. It wasn't forever. And maybe you're suffering. Maybe there's something that you're suffering with in your life. Maybe there's a situation or, you know, in your family situation or something that you're storing or in your body. But let me tell you, your suffering is not forever. There's a beginning and an end to it. It has to come to an end. And I pray that today it will be your end. Mm -hmm. I pray that God will bring whatever it is that you've been suffering from for a long time, whether it's anxiety, fears, worries, pain. Maybe you just don't want to get up in the morning. Maybe you feel like there is no future. Maybe you have to get the victory over your emotions. Maybe your emotions get the better of you. Anybody know anybody that for sure their emotions get the better of them? Outbursts of anger, fits of rage. You know, lose it. Have you ever lost it? Come on, I, I, I can put my hand up. I've lost it sometimes. I lost it so bad one time. I remember I was going to do a Bible study on a Friday night. I was passing this church. And me and my wife, we had such a bad fight in the car. Now, we don't fight regularly. It's a, it's a rare thing. But we had such a bad argument in the car on the way to the Bible study. I had to call him a cancer. I said, I cannot go and teach the Word of God in the spirit that I was. I just couldn't. It just wouldn't be right. I had to cancel. Now that was the only time I think I ever canceled. But you know, you will have trouble. Hallelujah. Paul the Apostle said, if you get married, you will have trouble. <laughs> that, that's the word of God. You will have, you will have your marriages. You know. But thank you to God if you can forgive each other, you can go back to where it was. But this is the problem. You have to overcome emotions. You can't keep the record of wrongs forever. You know, you have to let go of some stuff. You can't hold on to all of these baggage and bad things that happened. God gave us the victory. They're, they're, we cannot live in our past, brothers and sisters. We cannot keep records of wrongs. We have to let go of some people who have made mistakes. You know, they have to start again. The Bible says we have to snatch some out of the fire. If that's what we have to do. So your suffering has a beginning and an end. Hallelujah. You can't stay in it forever. It has to end. Another one is about hidden manna. A white stone with a new name that nobody will understand. Hidden manna. We know that the manna, when it talks about in the Old Testament, it was manna that came out of heaven, bread, food, that fed, that nourished the Israelites. So this hidden manna, well, to me, it's all about new revelation. It's all about spiritual nourishment. Mm. Making me strong spiritually. You know, giving me more insight about God, about the deeper things of God, about the meat of God's word, about revelation. You know, God give me understanding of dreams or give me understanding of vision. You know, bring me deeper and bring me higher, God, so I can understand more. I want to be more like Him. I want to understand. And this is what spiritual nourishment is. We grow. We become deeper in the things of God. We want to get not just normal. So we want to we want to read one chapter and can't get past it because God has given us so much revelation, things that we did not see before that we just read, and all of a sudden it's starting to jump out. That's when you start to get these hidden things, secret things that God begins to reveal in His Word. Hallelujah. 
But Pergamum was a place, the Bible says, where Satan lives. That Pergamum was such a city that where this church was, that it was actually considered Satan's abode. It was so possessed. And yet there was a little bit of light, a church still in that place. And what they had to overcome was false teaching. You know, there are people today that will teach that you can't eat pig if you're a Christian. You can't eat shellfish. There are people going around teaching. Now listen, let me make it very clear. You can eat what you want. Now you may say that that ain't true. You know how many people I know as Christians who will not eat swine. Not because it's bad for you, but because the Bible says it's an abomination. And they're still stuck in the Old Testament. Because it's crazy, because Jesus says, it's not what goes into your mouth defies you, but what comes out of it. So eating any, I don't, if you want to eat rats, go eat rats. If you want to eat a snake, go ahead. It's not going to defy you spiritually. It may make you sick, but it won't defy you. And if you ain't got no food, you, it might look pretty good. There are some people that say it's a delicacy. But that's not the point. You know, eat whatever you want without raising conscience. And don't judge other people when they're eating. If they think that swine is about, let them think so. We don't have to correct everybody. But there are actually people teaching much worse doctrine than that. <laughs> much worse doctrine. And we have to be careful with doctrine and false teaching. People saying that you know, Christ is going to come back next week or next year or 10 years. We have to be very careful because then again the word says that no man knows the hour. Yeah. So if a man now is telling us or a woman is telling us, oh God spoke to them. God told me in a dream that the end of the world is going to be this date. And people are selling their homes. You know the Jehovah Witnesses, they, many of them have had these predictions by their leader in Brooklyn and sold their homes and everything. And this is true, look it up. And the date was wrong, and then he changed the date, and he changed the date again, and changed the date again, and forever changed the date, because no man will ever know the hour. Only God. And that angel will tell, even Jesus doesn't know it. Amen. Even Jesus, it says. That's what the word says. So God the Father will tell his angel, blow the trumpet, Jesus will know, back he comes. Off we go. End the story. We start a new life in paradise. No more pain. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more heartache. We live in paradise with God forever and ever. Every tear will be wiped away. We won't be thinking about down here what happened, the hurts and the pains and all. We will be living with God forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. We will have a body that will never have any aches or pains. Huh? Come on, somebody say it, man. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? You won't need a mortgage. There won't be no banks. Hallelujah. No lawyers. You won't have no courts. <laughs> Only a court of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And He will give you a new name. You see, it's nice to have a new name from God. Saul went to Paul. We saw Jacob went to Israel. You know, Sarai to Sarah. Abraham to Abraham. God gives new names. We don't know what name, but if you overcome, it will have symbolic meaning. Your victory. When, when God gives you a new name, it has symbolic meaning to you and to others. If you're called by that name, because Jewish people gave names to their children, it were prophetic names that they would become the name given to them. And so this is going to go back to that God will give us a new name if we overcome. Power over the nations. I love this part. Look at I said three things now. Never blot out their names. If they overcome, Jesus says to the church in Sardis, wake up. Wake up, he said. Strengthen that which is left. And he said, if you overcome, I will never blot out your name from the book of life. That's some serious threat. And there are people teaching that it's impossible for you to lose your salvation. That's, I would have to question that teaching. I really have to question that. Because by what I'm reading, these were believers, these were churches he was talking to. These were not unsaved people. This was the church. So let's wake up, become the pillar in the temple. 
Hold on to what you have. Tell your neighbor to hold on. Hold on. Jesus is coming. Help is in his hand. All you've got to do is hold on. Hold on. And I just want to pray for some people today. That you want to say yes, Lord. Hallelujah. That you want to say yes, Lord, to your situation that he's able. I want to pray simple prayer today for anybody here that you're in that situation. And by faith in this word today, because the word of God, I believe, says signs, wonders, and miracles will follow yes. after Jesus. the preaching of God's word. Yes. That, that could be right now, yes. as soon as I stop. Yes. That yes. could be tomorrow yes. morning. Yes, Lord. That could be tomorrow, whatever it is. It will follow. Now, I believe in that word. Mm. I believe signs, wonders, and miracles will follow the preaching, the true preaching, if you believe that I'm sent by God, if you feel any anointing or any presence on this preaching, if you feel that there's any bit of authority, or truly am I sent from God, yes. or man of God, if there's anything that you can truly believe, that yes, maybe Paul today is speaking by the Holy Spirit. Wow. If you can believe part of that today, and grab a hold of that, yes, and put it in your heart, mm. and apply it to your life, mm. manifestations of signs, wonders, and miracles will take place, yes. not maybe. Yes. Because you have to cooperate with God's Holy Spirit. Mm. Your faith, you have to cooperate with God. Mm. And that part of you that does that is faith. Yes. Lord. So if you have a problem with my preaching today, if you have a problem with my message, what you should be asking God today is for help me with my own belief. Mm. Because I believe every part of this is the Word of God. Yeah. And I believe that this Word this morning is for you to overcome Amen. your trials, your struggles, whatever it is that's put in your pathway that you will overcome. And you will succeed. And you will achieve. And you will overcome. And you will go forward. And you will put a path down for Jesus to walk on. You will make level ground. Hallelujah.